Why hello, my fellow apes, I hope you're well, and that you're not eating. Like, seriously, if you're eating, pause this video and come back later, because things are about to get really uncomfortable really quick. You've, uh, you've been warned. Draconculiasis, which is derived from the Latin affliction with little dragons, is a parasitic infection caused by the guinea worm. A person becomes infected by drinking water that contains microcrustaceans infected with guinea worm larvae, and once one's stomach acid dissolves the crustaceans, the larvae then penetrate your digestive tract, escaping into your body, where over the following year, they grow up to 80 centimeters or 31 inches in length. The worms then mate, with the males dying shortly after, but the females eventually migrate to your subcutaneous tissue, where they cause an extremely painful blister to erupt that compels you to submerge the wound in water. Then, over several days or weeks, the worm slowly emerges from the laceration, and expels thousands of larvae into the water, which in turn infects crustaceans, thus continuing the so-called BEA beautiful circle of life. Now, as if this absolute nightmare fuel wasn't already traumatic enough, the issue of removing the worm is a horror in itself. The worm's emergence can disable victims for up to 10 weeks, and if the wound is on a joint, permanent stiffness and pain is very common. What's more, the parasite often causes secondary infections, which lead to death in about 1% of cases. So, how does one safely remove these beasts? Well, once the worm emerges, medics typically wrap it around a stick to maintain tension, and then gently turn the stick until the worm exits the body. Which takes a month. Yeah, a month. Since if too much pressure is applied at any one time, then the worm breaks and dies, causing a whole host of additional issues. And unfortunately, despite technological advancement, there is still no medicine or vaccine against this disease, and infection does not create immunity, meaning that one can experience this debilitating affliction many times throughout their life. Now, if there is a god, and he is, as theists tend to insist, all-powerful and all-loving, then for what possible mysterious reason did he create these disgusting fiery serpents, as they've been referred to in scripture? This is the question that Stephen Fry posed on the meaning of life, when the host said the following. Suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates, and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? And Fry's response ruffled the feathers of many, including, evidently, Jordan Peterson, who in his recent conversation with Fry sought to challenge him. Which, without further ado, We'll get to now. Right. Okay. I'm going to read something and forgive me. But no. I want to go here. You're face to face with God. <laughs> Bone cancer in children. Bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? Hmm. What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? How dare you create a world where there is such misery that's not our fault? It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. And you think you're going to get in no, on that? No, but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. And then one more. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac, totally selfish, totally... We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. So the specific parasitic disease that Fry was referring to here is called onchocerasis, but it's more commonly known as river blindness, and likewise to the guinea worm, it's pure nightmare fuel. Unlike the guinea worm, however, you don't need to drink anything to get it. Rather, infected blackflies need to drink you, and in doing so deposit larvae into your body. A few moons later, the adult worms then produce larvae of their own, which make their way to your skin, where they can infect any blackflies that bite you, thus continuing, again, the circle of life. It's the circle of life. 
Symptoms include severe itching, bumps under the skin, skin rashes, depigmentation, and indeed blindness. I first saw this photo, taken by the World Health Organization, when I was a teen, which depicts children leading their blind adults, and I was then, as I am now, utterly appalled. I mean, for the naturalist, parasites like these are easy to explain. In fact, they're expected. Mother Nature is not conscious, and so she doesn't care for our plight. But for the vast majority of theists, who believe that God is all-powerful and all-loving, we have to ask, why? Why do these devastating parasites exist? And further still, why did God create them long before he created humans, before the fall? Are we really to believe, really, that the perfect plan for the perfect mammal necessitated all this excruciating suffering? Is this really the best of all possible worlds? And know that this isn't an argument from emotion. It has an element of emotion, granted, but make no mistake about it. The argument is logical, and it was expressed in logical form 2,300 years ago. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Well, if we wanted to consider the various responses to the problem of evil, or theodicies, we'd be here for eternity. I will, in time, dedicate an entire series to this in the future, but here we're going to focus exclusively on Peterson's approach. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac. Ivan in the Brothers Karamazov. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Right. Now it's in, okay, so yes, what happens in the Brothers Karam Karamazov is that Ivan wins the argument. Yeah. But Elosia is the better person. Completely and, so. And, and we right, love right. him. So it's, yeah. it's right. a book so everyone it's very should interesting. read. I, I would urge right. everyone to read The Brothers Karamazov because I, I do think it's a work of genius. Due in part to Peterson and Fry's shared knowledge of The Brothers Karamazov, they don't really flesh out why precisely Elosia is a better person than Ivan, and they move on quickly. But for what it's worth, I'll give a bit of context. Elosia is the hero of the book. He's young, handsome, selfless, gentle, easygoing, and loving and his Christian faith defines his character. But he's not an intellectual powerhouse. He's a bit of a C.S. Lewis, if you will. Whereas Ivan is, as Peterson has said many times before, more of a Nietzsche. He's extremely intelligent, eloquent, and brave, but he's also nihilistic, and finds human suffering, and especially the suffering of children, to render the existence of an all-powerful, all-loving God to be absurd. And the crux of the debate between the two, as Peterson has put it elsewhere, is, well, Here's how he puts it. And Elosha, Elosha, can't address a single one of Ivan's criticisms. And, and he doesn't have the intellect for it. And, and, and Ivan has a devastating intellect. It's devastating to him, himself, as well. But what happens in the Brothers Karamazov, essentially, is that Elosha continues to act out his commitment to the good, let's say. And in that manner, he's triumphant. It doesn't matter that he loses the arguments, because the arguments aren't exactly the point. Or, to give another perspective, here's how Sparks Notes puts it. Ilosha's way of life seems superior to that of other characters. He is the moral centre of the novel because he represents a model of attitude and behaviour that Dostoevsky considers the right one, the one most conducive to human happiness and peace, instead of trauma and conflict that afflict most of the novel's other major characters. And the reason why Peterson levied this against Fry, it seems, is because he found Fry's sentiment to be reminiscent of Ivan's, since both focus on the problem of evil. So, in a nutshell, and if I've understood Peterson correctly, he was implying that Fry's attitude is destructive and counterproductive, that he might well win the intellectual argument, but at the cost of happiness. I mean, I was answering a question that I was asked. I know, and I'm, I'm not, and trying, I'm not course, really not trying to put you on the my, spot. My point is, I don't believe there is such a being. But if there were, and he were the kind of being that has been worshipped and described by various religions around the world, the monotheistic religions, then I would have many bones to pick with him. Um, but of course, I don't believe there is such a thing. But the the argument from evil, as it's known, is a, is a very old one, and, and it goes back through through the, through you know medieval religious figures as well as uh, later humanists that this idea that uh, uh, it is it is very hard to square this loving God who has uh, knowledge of every hair on our head and adores us and um, and adores little kittens, but he also 
as I say, bone cancer in, in, in children, but also life cycles of insects that whose whole aim is to burrow into the eyes of children in Africa and and lay their eggs there and cause blindness for those children. I mean, you could quite easily picture a universe in which there weren't such an animal and in which children were not sent blind with pain and horror by the various bugs and fungi, fungi and insects and viruses in the world. There's, it, there's it, a, it isn't there's necessary. A, there's a worm. You, there's a worm in Africa that burrows under the skin, and it's a long worm. And oh, yes. if you you can pull it out with a pencil and wrap it, but it breaks. It's fragile, and then it gets infected. It's a terrible thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, Peterson, but we're not going to talk about the guinea worm again. We're done with that. Anyhow, as Fry said, the argument from evil, which is more commonly known as the problem of evil, has existed for thousands of years, and there are multiple variations, with some having, at least as far as I'm convinced, decent theological responses. For instance, more often than not, and given the opportunity, apologists are quick to frame the problem of evil in terms of specifically human action, such as one's ability to harm others, and they then explain this away in virtue of libertarian free will. The reason we can harm others, so they argue, is because this is a necessary consequence of the freedom that God has given us. And although I don't believe in libertarian free will, and so for me this defence is unsound, I can still appreciate that those who do believe in libertarian free will are likely to find this defence compelling. Fair enough. However, the variation of the problem of evil that Fry touches upon cannot be neutralised by this defence, since it doesn't refer to human action at all. We Homo sapiens emerged around 300,000 years ago, and yet, and to give just one example, 65 million years before us, 75% of species on Earth, including billions of sentient beings, were vanquished in an extinction that God either deliberately conducted or was powerless to prevent. Think of the suffering inflicted upon so many. The skies blackened with rubble, as billions of God's petrified children are starved of sustenance. And for what reason? Again, I say, this is no problem for the naturalist, nature doesn't care, but an omnibenevolent God cares by definition, and so the followers of the Triomni Lord have to maintain that all this suffering, all this harm, is somehow for the best. That the world that we inhabit, where children die from cancer, rabbits are ripped apart by wolves, and raging fires annihilate forest creatures millions of years before the dawn of humanity, is somehow the absolute best world that an all-powerful, all-loving God could create. I mean, as far as I'm convinced, a faith of this magnitude is a greater parasite than a thousand fiery serpents. And I would say, so let's take the argument you made there, and... To, there's, a, there's a direction that goes in that's nihilistic and resentful and vengeful and angry and all understandable. Yes. But to me, counter it doesn't look to me like there's anything good in it. It looks like it's entirely counterproductive. It, it, it makes the problem it purports to uh, have been generated by worse. Mm -hmm. and, and it, it so it, so the then error. the question is, What's the appropriate attitude, given that the argument you make is actually an extraordinarily powerful argument? And I don't know the answer to that, but I, but I do know, I think, that resentment and anger, and even the motive that would make you want to say that to God himself, I think that's probably not helpful, <laughs> even though it's so... Well, it, I came to that with great difficulty. I mean, I've had my reasons to be resentful and angry, especially recently. And because I'm suffering a lot of pain yeah. and yeah. it makes me resentful and angry and wanting to shake my fist. Yeah. But I found upon intense consideration that there was nothing in that that didn't make it worse and that therefore that must be wrong. Even though no, it's agree. justifiable, no, right? Jordan, it's... Jordan, I, I completely understand. And you must remember that my response was to a question I didn't see coming, and it was amused. It, it was because I don't believe in this God, it's not an issue. I'm not really resentful and angry about the fact that there's evil in the world. I'm sorrowful very often, and I'm united in my admiration for the fact and the real belief I have that most people, fundamentally, uh, given this dysfunction or this deep trauma, most people are so good, are so anxious to be good, are, are deontically good, have a, have a sense of obligation and, and, and drive in them to be better than they are. I think that's, that's one of the key things I love about humanity is not just 
that we are dissatisfied with things that are wrong and can be improved, but that with ourselves we are dissatisfied and that most of us want to be better. So the primary topic at hand here is the observation that atheists are angry, which Peterson believes is not helpful since this mentality leads to much of the issues that Ivan suffers in the brothers Karazimov. It compounds the issue, as Fry put it, and I too can understand Peterson's concern, as many atheists, including myself, and just a moment ago no less, often express what appears to be anger at God. But to ensure that the stance is understood, let's put another example on the table. Hell. The notion of an atheist being charged with an infinite punishment, hell, for the finite crime of using the brain that God gave them, is something I find not only utterly illogical and pathetic, but straight up evil. What a tyrant's hill we would be beneath if such a ghastly entity existed. A god that creates his children sick and then forsakes them for not being well is a divine prick. But likewise to Fry, I don't believe that such a god exists. And so, I'm not really angry at God, just as I'm not angry at Thanos. I find the overwhelming suffering in this world to be incredibly sad, but I'm no more angry at it than I am the wind, for both are without intent. I, I know that's true of me all the time. Every time I go off to sleep, I think, how did I screw up tonight, today? How can I be better tomorrow? Why am I so bad at this? If only I could manage that in, in moral terms, genuine moral terms. I, yes, I, I think that's genuinely. an extraordinarily common experience so and too. very much under noticed. Yeah, yeah. And part of the reason, as far as I can tell, that the talks that I've been giving, let's say, have had the effect that they've had is because I do point out that that's an extraordinarily common experience yeah that 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 self-torture by conscience and it does indicate um this striving towards a higher mode of being the other question i have when i look at the 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 response that that i just read is that the amount of the world's evil that's a consequence of our voluntary moral insufficiencies is indeterminate you know so you mm. might say hypothetically speaking that as part of God's creation, we actually have important work to do. And if we shirk it, the consequences are real. Yeah. And you might say, well, that's just an apology for God. And perhaps that's the case. And perhaps there's no God at all. And so what the hell are we talking about? Yes, I would say that's just an apology for God and that it presupposes and is predicated upon libertarian free will. What possible work, I ask, could we do to neutralise the incredibly cruel and brutal mass extinctions that occurred millions or hundreds of millions of years before our dawn? But to adequately address Peterson's apology here, we'd need more on the table, and we don't for understandable reason. Anyhow, from here, Fry pressures Peterson on what he means by a higher mode of being, but we have to address this, if at all, in another video. All right, let's recap and wrap up. This is the second video I've made in response to Peterson and Fry's conversation, which once again, I highly recommend. And the primary contention we focused on here revolves around the notion that atheists are angry at God. If I'm correct in my assessment, Peterson saw the dark of Ivan in Fry, believing his anger to be destructive and counterproductive. But Fry clarified that he's not actually angry at God since he doesn't believe that God exists. But if it turned out that God did exist, the God that's been described by most theists, then Fry would have a few bones to pick with him, and he's not alone. Peterson then loosely offered an apology for the problem of evil, which pertains to libertarian free will, but this doesn't, as I hope I've made clear, even remotely address the variation of the problem of evil that Fry finds compelling. Now, if you'd like me to make a third video in this series, which would likely focus on Peterson's use of the term higher mode of being, then please do let me know. I have so many projects on the back burner at the moment, and I just don't know which one to put in the oven. Anyhow, I'll leave you with two quotes from the man whose shadow we all sit within. But before doing so, I just want to plug the mug. If you're able and willing to support the channel, then please do check out Patreon and YouTube members, which offer an array of unique goodies, including this tankard of truth. In 1856, Charles Darwin wrote the following. What a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blunderingly low and horridly cruel works of nature, which he bolstered in his autobiography by saying, A being so powerful and so full of knowledge as a god who could create the universe is to our finite minds omnipotent and omniscient, 
and it revolts our understanding to suppose that his benevolence is not unbound. For what advantage can there be in the suffering of millions of the lower animals throughout almost endless time? This very old argument from the existence of suffering against the existence of an intelligent first cause seems to me a strong one.